on behalf of satyam sumiran yoga research foundation sswrf i neela tamane welcome all of you in the fifth satyam satyam yoga conclave so uh, these conclaves are the part of uh, uh, the activity uh, of satyam shatabdi yoga varga yoga yaga a year long series of yogic spiritual uh, ecological and social 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 spiritual activities these activities are being conducted on the uh, occasion of birth centenary year of paramhansa swami satyananda saraswati uh, who is a pioneer in the field of yoga uh, dr swami yoga pratap ji is a founder of ssyrf okay. as we know uh, all know uh, under his guidance we are conducting all these activities ssyrf is conducting all these activities and this conclave uh, are also conducted every month on fourth saturday and uh, uh, sundays uh, in four the, these are conducted in four sessions and uh, 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 in four session morning and evening at 7:30 each day both the days so uh, ssy rf invites eminent speakers for these conclaves and uh, really we get, we gain very much from their speech up till now so uh, the theme of today's conclave is yoga and education so uh, swami yoga pratap ji will conduct this first session and uh, explain us the basics of application of uh, yoga in the field of education uh, and uh, education and learning so i request swami ji uh, to guide us on uh, this uh, uh, this theme but before that i will definitely request all of you to uh, drop your questions in the chat box so swami ji can reply to it uh, answer to it uh, on the questions so uh, swami ji please namona ken namona let us begin with remembering gurudev a short prayer to guru gently close your eyes अखंड मंडलाकार व्याप्त ये नाचराचर तत्पद दर्शित ये नस्म श्रीगुरव नम अज्ञानतिमीराजनशलाकया चक्षुन्मील ये न तस्म श्रीगुरव नम गुरुर्ब्रह गुरुर्विष्णु गुरोर्देव महेशर गुरो साक्षात्ब्रह्म तस्म श्रीगुरव नम ध्यानमूल गुरोर्मूर्ति पूजामूल गुरोपद मंत्रूल गुरोवाक्यम मोक्षमूल गुरोपा मोक्षमूल गुरोपा मोक्षमूल गुरोपा ओ शांति 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 जेंटली कीप योर आईज क्लोज एंड विजुअलाइज द फॉर्म ऑफ गुरु द डिस्पेलर ऑफ डार्कनेस रिमूवर ऑफ द वेल ऑफ इग्नोरेंस एंड ऑफ अ प्रणाम टू द एंटायर गुरु परंपरा Swami Shivanand Ji Maharaj, Swami Satyanand Ji Maharaj, Swami Niranjana Nand Ji, and Pithadi Shwari Swami Satya Sangha Nand Ji, offering pranam to the entire Guru Parampara, 
let us begin today's conference on clay it has been a great privilege to be able to make a, even a small offering to gurudev the contributions of swami ji are beyond comprehension the type of activity which he has done i believe it is very difficult even for a person to do it in multiple lifetimes but he did it in one life and much more this is his birth centenary and in the spirit of the aarti which we sing in the aarti it is said tera tujko arpan kya lage mera in sanskrit it is said tvadiya vastu govinda tubhya meva samarpaya what you have taught me what you have taught us let us try and understand that imbibe that in our lives share it with others and that is the true dedication to guru what does guru want guru is the source of all knowledge guru is the representative of para brahma he doesn't need anything it is we who need and out of great compassion guru comes in our lives to dispel darkness from our lives which means we are in darkness we are in andhakar groping in the darkness and when in the darkness we see a rope we mistake it for the snake and we are convinced it is the snake starts shouting and screaming and yelling and pressing the panic buttons when there is no need to do that no amount of explanation no amount of counseling no amount of telling makes any difference we need somebody who can either turn on the switch or sh- shine a torch light and then our perception changes oh it's just a rope and all the panic all the fear all just starts vanishing in a moment that is the beauty of india college and what we speak of today and in this conclave is about knowledge education is one aspect but this is about knowledge knowledge enlightens it enlightens on the mundane level and it also enlightens on the transcendental level what it does on the transcendental level is something which cannot be spoken in words it is something which needs to be experienced and it is a lifelong journey so instead of trying to waste time on speaking about something which cannot either be spoken about or comprehended by words let us try and understand how yoga a vidya in itself makes a difference in our lives this conclave is dedicated towards that in the beginning of the month we had a session wherein we spoke about vidya and we spoke that vidya is apara and para para is transcendental apara is mundane but vidya in every form enlightens be it the ability to make transactions in daily life be it the ability to comprehend a event which is happening everything needs knowledge in absence of knowledge we are nothing but a vegetable or a piece of a stone how can we inculcate that knowledge 
imbibe how can we make a difference in our lives that is something which is very essential and that is something which we need to understand and while we know that apara vidya is the mundane knowledge that again has two aspects that which can enrich our living and that which can enrich our vocational training in sanskrit it is known as jivika and upajivika the knowledge the education which we receive today the formal education that education focuses almost solely on the upajivika and please note that our ancestors placed great emphasis and importance on upajivika technical knowledge which can earn us livelihood but they called it as upajivika one step below jivika jivika means the art of living life we don't know how to live life we don't know what to do when and we make all sorts of mistakes information has come in we live in the era of information overload we have the google devata which gives you all the information but who is going to give you the ability to discriminate is this the correct information or is it the wrong information we all, we all know the wrong information can lead us to darkness and in the isha vasya upanishad it is very clearly mentioned that you can land up into worse situations if you are not able to balance you need to balance things just information alone can lead you to a mistake and that mistake can cost you much more than the error you would do when you are in ignorance so therefore it becomes even more crucial to understand and to be able to discriminate what to do when how can i be at the right time at the right moment and in the right manner prabhu shri ram was able to do this he was at the right time at the right place however he also knew what is the right thing to do he was being crowned as the crown prince the crowning glory of any young youth and everything changed in a moment he was told by his mother of you go to the forest live like a mendicant forget the kingly pleasures and uh, duties they are no longer for you if it were any one of us we would have gone into a either a panic attack or an aggressive mode how dare you do that to me etc but no shri ram did not do this what did he how did he respond he responded by saying if it was just such a small thing why did father have to feel so guilty and so pain that is something which is hurting me he should just have called me and told and i would have gone very happily it's my great pleasure and privilege to be able to do what my parents tell me that was the his response and more than that he used this adversity to great effect there was a great terrorist and that terrorist had a pact with the king of kosalapuri for those of you who don't know ayodhya is not the real name the real name is kosalapuri but ayodhya came to be the name because it had signed a no war treaty and that is why ravana invaded everybody but not kosalapuri and as the prince as the kingly 
representative of Kosalpuri, nobody was, had the authority to attack Ravana. The moment Ram was exiled, he made use of this, prepared for 10 years and then went and instigated Ravana and destroyed Ravana. He converted an adversity into an opportunity oh so beautifully, so magnificently that hundreds and thousands of years later, we still remember him. Do not think of Sri Ram as God who has descended. No, you are taking away the greatness by saying that. Because the moment he is God, he can do everything. No, he was an ordinary person. But with an enlightened consciousness. And he lived that life so that we can understand how do we behave in life. How do we behave in life? That is the most important thing. And that is the other aspect of knowledge, Vidya. That is the part which is Jivika. And that is the part which gives us a samskara. What is samskara? Samskar is very clearly defined in the scriptures. They say, dosha apanayana purvakam gunadhanaha samskaraha. It removes your defects and increases the qualities. That is samskar. Samskar is not a ritual. We have reduced it to a ritual. Samskar is that which is inculcated in you by which you behave in a specific manner. You respond in a specific manner. You don't react to a situation, but you respond to it with complete awareness, knowledge and decision. That is samskar. It was that samskar which allowed Ram to become Sri Ram. And it is this samskar which can change our lives. But the question is, how do we do that? That is where yoga comes in. Param Guru Swami Shivananji Maharaj had said in one place, in fact, there's an entire book written by him on that. Eradicate, eradicate a vice and cultivate a virtue. If you look at what he has written and if you look at this definition, it is not nothing else but creating a samskara within yourself. Dosha apanayana purvaka, eradicate a vice. Gunadhanaha, bring in a quality, cultivate a virtue. That is samskara. How to do it? Because we know habits are stubborn things. Do you know this? I, I hope at least some of you know the story of habit. Many, many years ago, I believe Wrangler Narayikar had spoken about it. He said, habits are stubborn things. If you take H out of it, a bit of it remains. If you take A out of it, bit of it still remains. If you take B out of it, still it remains. So you have made lot of effort and steadily you are taking away the vice. But suddenly, entirety comes back in. I take a resolve that I will not smoke. I stick to it for two days, three days, four days, five days, one week and I am very happy. And then one fine day, suddenly it strikes and you are back to ground zero. That is habit. Not intellectual. You cannot make any impact only intellectually. Everybody knows. On the packet of the cigarette it is written, cigarette smoking is injurious to health. Does it stop any smoker from smoking? No. It is futile. Because we work not from the level of intellect, but from something much deeper. How can we make a change in there? That is what yoga is all about. Yoga is the science which manages the mind. 
and not only does it manage the mind but it also refines the mind it allows the mind to become subtle it allows the mind to be able to perceive better to remove the filters if i had blue and green and red filters in front of my eyes what would i see i will see the world colored and tinted in those colors bit by bit i need to take those filters out so that i can actually see the world as it is no distortions that is what is essential improving the perception that is what knowledge is about how can one enlighten oneself by bringing these qualities within it allows us to improve our perception and then a time comes when the mythological fabled third eye opens the third eye is not the eye of the physical dimension these are known as the charma chakshu the physical eyes then we have knowledge which brings us the jnana chakshu but above that we need something which can take us to the dimension beyond to the dimension of intuition and beyond that is where the third eye opens and it is this third eye the eye of discrimination which is very essential what is real what is unreal what is appropriate what is inappropriate how should i behave how should i not behave what has happened and in the larger perspective how should i understand this this is something which is very essential for us to understand and this is what yoga allows us to imbibe within many many years ago when gurudev swami satyanand ji he left his home in search of his guru because he was convinced that the life which he was leading was incomplete even at a young age swami ji was a versatile genius he knew and he was very capable all subjects he was able to master and at the same time he was having spiritual experiences also but then those experiences gave him a glimpse of what is beyond he said we are just having beads of glass and we think it is diamond we are mistaken we have to go for the real diamond not just the beads of glass and he set off on that journey and when he met his guru swami shivanand ji all the questions in his mind stopped he said my mind became quiet and i knew i was in the company of my master that is how he connected with his guru and the guru did not tell him okay do this sadhana the other sadhana third sadhana fourth sadhana and then bring uh, study the scriptures bring all that knowledge learn it by heart no what did gurudev swami shivanand ji tell gurudev swami satyanand ji he told him work hard and you will be purified you do not have to bring the light to you the light will unfold from within very important the light is there within knowledge vidya is there within all is that it has been covered with the suit of ignorance if you know the lantern if you have worked with a lantern nowadays it's not possible because i guess it no longer exists in the cities at least but in the olden days in our ashram we used to work with lanterns and we have seen you have the lantern and you turn the wick high the flame comes up and soon there is black suit which covers the glass around the lantern and then the light becomes dimmer and dimmer and dimmer and dimmer and dimmer at this point if we try and increase the wick it just keeps getting darker and darker andhena tama pravishanti 
This is very essential to understand. Just studying and gobbling information is not sufficient. No. We need to clean this suit. You reduce the wick. Clean the suit. Then suddenly the light appears. That is the beauty of knowledge. Today, when we are trying to learn, I have interacted with students once upon a time. I was also a student myself. All of you were students also. There is something known as studying hard. But there is something known as studying smart. What is studying smart? The moment you understand the functioning of the mind, you know how to work it through. Don't say that I don't remember, I forget. You do remember. You play the jingle of your favorite movie song and immediately you start tapping to the beat of it and you start humming that song. You did not forget that. You smell your favorite dish from a distance and you say, oh, that dish is being prepared. Let me go and have it. You did not forget that. So how can you say that I cannot remember? Because I do not know how my mind stores the information. My mind stores information in the form of association, in the form of images. And I am trying to put stuff in, in the form of totally unrelated, unassociated bits of information. And it's not going to pick it up. But at the same time, if you turn it round and create appropriate associations, appropriate images, things come up. Very simple story. You might not remember what is told to you, but you will remember the story which your grandmother had told or a beautiful story which somebody had told and it appealed to you. The story sometimes tells much more than just the words. They are known as fables. And they teach us. In India, it is known as the Panchatantra, which teaches us how to live. It is not the story of the tiger and the deer and the this and the that. No. It is between the lines what we have to understand. And our brain picks it up. You tell that story to children, it bypasses the intellect and goes straight deep within. They keep it in their mind. And at the right time, it comes out. That is the power of the unconscious mind. Modern science works with the mind. It has tried to work with the conscious aspect of the mind. And now it is scratching the subconscious and unconscious. But it has not been able to understand till in, in depth the basis of the mind. <clears throat> yoga has understood the basis. And yoga is based on the structure of the mind. And that is the reason why yoga can be utilized in great efficiency in various aspects of learning. Gurudev Swami Satyananji discovered this aspect. I will narrate a small incident to you. When Swamiji was in his Guru Ashram at Rishikesh, Divine Life Society, at that time, Swamiji used to work hard. He had activities in the day, also at night. So he would complete all his activities and then he would go and sleep in a specific area which was allotted to him. It so happened that where he was sleeping, just a wall away, thin wall away, 
there would be the chanting of the Vedic mantras. The whole night, Swamiji would be awake and about 3 or 4 o'clock, Swamiji would complete his duties and go off to sleep. Around 4 o'clock was the time that the teacher of the Sanskrit mantras, Vedic mantras would come, the students would come and they would chant the mantras. Swamiji was sleeping blissfully unaware of what is happening. One day, there was a program. And in the program, these students were there and they were chanting these Vedic mantras. Swamiji was surprised because he was humming those mantras. He did not, he had never read them. He did not know what they were. But how was he humming them? Swamiji was puzzled. Kept on thinking, kept on thinking, kept on thinking. And then he finally went and asked the teacher because he could not get the answers. He went to the teacher and he said that, what are these mantras? I have never heard them earlier, but somehow or the other, I seem to know them. The teacher smiled and said, my dear, you were sleeping over there when the mantras were being chanted. Swamiji said, but yeah, I was sleeping. I was not awake. The teacher said, yes, you were sleeping, but there was somebody inside you who was awake and he was listening. And that was the moment when Swamiji discovered the power of Yoga Nidra, which he developed later on. In Yoga Nidra, we are connecting beyond the intellect. When we are awake, it is the conscious mind which works and the conscious mind creates a barrier. There is information which is available below, but it cannot come up because of this barrier. And many times it cannot go in, also get stuck. In the process of Yoga Nidra, we move away the conscious mind and connect directly to the subconscious. Hundred, many years later, when Swamiji started his activities in Bihar school of Yoga Munger, he did an experiment. There was a, you know, all sorts of people used to come to him. And there was also one boy who was there. And that boy was very, very naughty. Very rebellious. The whole day he would run around full of mischiefs and pranks. The only thing was that when he slept, he would be dead to the world. They say that you could even lift the chowki where he was and put him somewhere else. He would not even know. Swamiji took this boy and when this boy was sleeping, Swamiji gave him all the information. Intellectually, the next day, the boy didn't know anything. But in three years times, four years times, Swamiji told him that your education, your training is complete. Now go. Everybody was surprised. Even the boy was surprised. He said, well, I don't know anything. Swamiji said, Koi baat nahi jao. And Swamiji sent him off. At the age of 11, young Swami Niranjan was sent off. And he traveled for next 11 years. He traveled all over the world, spreading the message of yoga. And Swami Niranjan Ananji tells that many times information would just come from within. He would not know where it has come from. It was what Swamiji had implanted in him and that was coming out because Swamiji knew how to make use of the mind, harnessing the potential of the mind. If you don't know the mechanics of the mind, you will not be able to harness its potential. Yoga knows how to work with the mind. Yoga knows the limitations of the mind and yoga knows its strength also. And yoga knows how to get the mind moving. In olden days, there was a story. Some of you might have even seen it. About the donkey and the carrot. I had seen this once myself and I was, I mean, I have heard this story and I always thought it was more of a fiction. They say that when a donkey gets stuck, doesn't move, you 
dangle carrot in front of him and he will move. I thought it was a fiction. But one day I really saw in the marketplace, a donkey just stood. No amount of pushing, no amount of pulling, nothing worked. They were whacked. The donkey was whacked with sticks, but he would not budge. Finally, some old man said, Are, the carrot was dangled in front of him and the donkey started moving. Until and unless you don't know which button to press, nothing is going to work. Yoga knows which buttons to press so that the mind can be harnessed. This is the story of Swami Nirenjananandji. He was never, he has never gone to any school. He has never received formal education. From the age of 11, he was out teaching. And there is a story that one day, Swami Niranjananji had to address the scientists. And that night, he in his dream, had a vision and he saw few aspects and the next day he went and he spoke about it. For him, it was the most natural thing. But the scientists all were stumped, stunned, dumbfounded. They asked him, Swamiji, where did you know all this? This is just the newest aspect of science which is just being started and we are just grappling with the you know possibilities of it where did you know all these aspects how we can move ahead even we have not been able to come out with it swamiji said well it was just available i knew it i mean he did not say where did he get this information it came from the subconscious the unconscious which was able to connect to the superconscious. And in the superconscious, you have all the knowledge. And that knowledge is Vidya, that which allows us to illuminate, illuminate ourselves. The repository of such knowledge is known as the Vedas. Vedas are not texts. Vedas is a definition, a term given to that which allows the knowledge to be kept together and shared so that it eliminates. That is Vedas. And that is why the Vedas are said to be a Purusheya, beyond creation. Because knowledge always stays. Maybe we are not aware about it. Before the knowledge that the earth revolves around the sun, People thought the sun revolves around the earth. Did it make any difference to the sun and the earth? No. They kept on moving the same manner. We did not know that the atom and subatomic particles existed. Did that stop those particles to behave that way? No. There are so many things which we do not know even today. Does it mean that those principles of knowledge don't exist? They do exist. We are not aware about it. The process of inculcating that knowledge is what is Vidya. And the moment we connect with this principle, things start working, things start changing and perceptions change. Abilities come up. And this is not what I have told about Swami Niranjana Ananji is not an isolated incident. If you look at the story of Swami Vivekanandji, you will find the same thing. When he was on the boat to America, at that time, he used to get information. And so much so that sometimes persons next to him in the next room would say, who was it who was shouting so loudly at night? There was nobody. Swami Vivekananda was sleeping, but that knowledge which was there, that was reverberating. And that reverberation 
sparked out change in that person and he thought he was hearing it. That is why emphasis is placed on smell, vibration. Emphasis in India was never placed on the written letter but the spoken letter because the spoken letter creates vibration and that vibration creates a change within which brings about enlightenment. This is the process and this is the ultimate process. But when we have to reach class 11, class 12 or graduation, we start with class 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 and in the same way we will be working with the basics. In this coming conclave, current conclave, in the next three sessions, we will be looking at how yogic principles can make a difference. And I have chosen three aspects. The first aspect is that of students. All of us know, all of us were students and all of us know being a student is not the easiest thing in the world. Every day is a new challenge. Of course, there is a thrill and joy in encountering the challenge and overcoming it. But it's a challenge nevertheless. So, how can we overcome that challenge? That is essential to know. And I think the children of today's times, they are faced with greater challenges than ever. They have lots of expectations on them. They have so much of information that they don't know how, what to process and what not to process. Sometimes they are not given anything. Sometimes they are given so much that they don't know. So they are in a state of fusion, a state of distraction and that creates agitation. How can we work and remove agitations? Because these agitations affect the mind. And when the mind is affected, we cannot grasp things. We cannot store it. Because our mind is full of unnecessary garbage, which is of no use to me. It might be interesting, but it is of no use to me. I am hungry. I have not had food for days. I need food. But in my bag, I have got only books. I have got only dresses. I have got everything else in the world which is the best, the costliest, I have all the greatest jewels in the world. But I have no food. Is it of any use to me? For me, at that point of time, the best diamond, even if it be Kohinoor or whichever, is of no use because I cannot eat a Kohinoor. I need food to eat. At this time when children are studying and they are grasping, they need specific aspects. If those aspects are not provided to them, everything else is garbage for them. Ah, it might be interesting. It might uh, catch the fancy. But still, it is a garbage. Because it doesn't tell him or her what to do when a situation arises. It does not train the person when an adversity strikes how to respond. How can we as students make this change. So that will be the first session in the evening and we will be joined by a very bright, intelligent, budding doctor. She is in her final MBBS and she has seen how challenging it can be. She has observed and also by personal experience. And I have requested her to present the student's perspective of the challenges in learning. I might think that they have some problems, but they might have a different problem. We have to solve their problems, not superimpose our thoughts on them and try to solve that. Never works. So they will present what their problems are and then we will speak of 
how yoga can make a difference. And then there will be a panel discussion. Tomorrow morning in the second session, we will have a parent and an educator who has worked as an educationist, as a research scientist, as well as a parent. And so she knows what the challenges are for a parent. In olden days, children used to, at the age of seven or eight or nine, go to the Gurukul and study over there. Parents did not have to worry about the education of children. Imparting education, formal, non-formal, samskaras was the job of the Gurukul. And the Gurukul did it because they were experts in it. Today, the parents have to take up that role. And they are not trained in it. They don't know what the mind is. They themselves are grappled with the mind. What can they know about the mind? So they are at a disadvantage. Second disadvantage is that in their minds, they think of the problems which they have faced, the requirements which they had. And most of the times, they impose those requirements and problems on children. But they forget that the problems and situations which they had were of a yesteryear. And if we impose them on today's children, we are making an obsolete, redundant product. Because this child has to face today and tomorrow, not yesterday and today. If we prepare a child based on what I have undergone, I am preparing him for yesterday. But the situation of yesterday and the situation of today and tomorrow are different. So we are not training the child. But this is a problem which the parents have. So she will be presenting the challenges which parents face. And we will briefly touch upon how yogic tools can be used to smoothen this journey, to bring in the knowledge and make it work. And then the final concluding session we are very, very lucky and fortunate to have a very experienced, eminent psychiatrist who has worked extensively with all strata of society, including children, who has a very compassionate heart, very intuitive, and he has great interest in trying to work in the community, not just one-to-one, -one, but in the community, because that is where the problems come. In addition, he is also a practitioner of yoga for last 40 years. So he already has the knowledge of yoga. He has experienced it, not read it. So he will be speaking about the learning disorders and the special needs children because in today's times these are coming up. Every one in ten children unfortunately are having these and it seems only to be increasing and modern medicine with all its tomfoolery forgive my term is not able to give any answer to these difficulties which are coming up. What are these difficulties? What is the basis of that? How can we understand them better? Is what he will be explaining to us. He has consented to do it in a non-technical language. Otherwise, you know, we doctors are known for using bombastic and uh, you know complicated technical jargon. So that nobody can understand what we are saying. But he is not going to do that. He is going to decode it, simplify it and present it to us so that we understand what the problem is. And then the yogic tools and solutions will be discussed. And then at the end of every of, every of these sessions, we will be having a panel discussion. So I request all of you to participate wholeheartedly. It is only through interaction that information comes up. The butter 
does not come up just by looking at the buttermilk and praying to buttermilk. No, you need to churn it. And only when you churn it that the butter comes up. Without churning, nothing happens. The curd with water in it remains curds and water. Butter and buttermilk are not separated. For that, we need to practice. We need to interact. So, I request all of you to come up with questions. And the harder the questions, the better they are. Because then that brings up the joy of interaction and information comes up. We have various experts with us. And we have to make the best of them. Because they have taken time out. They have their own busy schedule. In spite of that, they have accepted to come as a dedication to Gurudev. No doubt. But let us try and make the best of it. From the last two sessions, there have been repeated requests and I also have felt that in this short period, we are covering information about various topics. But this is just touching the surface. If we need to know more, this one and a half hours is not sufficient. And therefore, because of popular demand, we will be conducting special workshops dedicated to a specific subject. And they will be following later, a week or two later, Saturday, Sundays. And I will uh, share the information with you and uh, it will come out in the emails and WhatsApp and all that. So that is how we will be working throughout the weekend. Let this knowledge slowly start coming up. We understand this and implement it in our life. If we don't understand it, we can't implement it. And if we just try to implement something without information, again, it doesn't work. Both of them need to Work, go together. Jnana and karma are the two yeah. wings of the bird. If one wing is weak, we cannot fly. We need both wings and both wings to move in synchronicity. It is not that one wing goes down, another comes up. No, then the flight doesn't take place. Both the wings have to go up and down. That is the synchronicity in the different aspects. Swami Shivananji had said, balance or harmony in the three aspects of our being, the head, the heart, the hand, is yoga. And yoga is nothing but illumination of the self, mind management, time management and self-management. We can't manage ourselves. That, how to manage ourselves, our mind, our time, our activities, that is what yoga is. Yoga is not asan, pranayam, pratyahar, dharana. They are all different tools. Paracetamol is not medicine. Crocin or ibuprofen or cetrizin. These are all different tools which are made available so that we can apply them and bring about a healing in people. In the same way, Yoga has multiple tools by which we can remove the veil of darkness and bring out the veil, bring out the knowledge within. And Swamiji has done it, not only intellectually, but he has shown it. In Munger, Swamiji inspired and Swami Ranjananji established the Pala Yoga Mitra Mandal where the yogic principles are shared with these children and these children come up oh so beautifully. One aspect. And at Rikhiya Peet, Swamiji established a different movement, the Kanyas and Batuks. And they have come up in a totally different manner. Both have been able to explore the genius within them. How? Through the application of principles of yoga. 
one was the principles of practices of yoga and one is the principle of living yoga both have brought out gems if you ever go and look at the children of baliyog mitra mandal or the kanyas and batuks you will be amazed at their abilities i mean there was a time when we had called different experts to teach children there were small workshops which we had not one or two or three but all the teachers who had come they said one thing swami ji we had prepared a syllabus for that week and then we had thought that if we do again we will do something else so i had prepared two or three advanced things but when i came here within the first two days the children just picked up everything they are like sponge they just take all the information and i mean i was not prepared to teach more than that so i had to struggle and scramble to bring all the information out and present it to them and they all got it they all took it and they have that how did that happen that happened because the inner principle within was activated in one satsang pujya gurudev swami ji had said maine inki kundalini jaga di hai ab wo kahan tak jati hai wo inke upar hai that genius within has been kindled now how much it goes is up to them that is what is the basis there is a divine being within us all we have to do is allow him to open allow it to open and blossom the moment that happens everything starts coming in that is what yoga is about and when we connect these principles and apply them to education no matter what type of education we will see that education blooms knowledge blooms abilities come up everything happens then we can create geniuses in the time of mahabharata if you re- read the whole place was full of geniuses how because yoga was a part and parcel of life in those times over years we have forgotten and moved away from those principles and no doubt that we are having lot of problems it is time that we connect to the roots allow us to replenish ourselves by nourishing the roots and let the blossom of the genius come and make a difference in our lives in our small society and in the civilization together and that is how we can make our contribution when paramhansa ji started his work he made a prophecy yoga will emerge as a powerful world culture and will change the course of world events 50 years ago people might have thought oh what is he saying 50 60 years later today we can see that yes yoga is becoming popular it is still not there where it is a world culture still place to go and when it becomes that it will change the course of world events 500 years ago we took one direction the industrial revolution it took us on one direction and for 500 years we have walked that path today we are on a very similar junction which road to take is the question in front of us as a civilization what is the answer we will take that will depend that will determine what is the direction the coming generations will walk upon so therefore we need to decide 
how can we decide if we don't know that is where yoga comes in and it is the duty of each and every yoga participant yoga sadhak to try and inculcate these principles and become a small beam of light you see if you look at the led halogens today they are not one big halogen which is sh shining light there are hundred small leds which are brought together and they throw a huge light why can't we become that nanoscopic microscopic led and all come together so that the light of yoga shines and the world walks on a better path it shuns that which is dangerous harmful negative detrimental and walks towards that which is conducive towards evolution growth benefit enrichment and ultimately realization that is the ultimate objective of yoga to illuminate and i hope that this conclave can shed a little bit of light on that that is the effort with which these conclaves are organized and they are a dedication to gurudev because he is the one who has shown the light and has shown us the path and it is for us to walk on with this i conclude the introduction and i hope that you will be asking me lots of questions and then we can have a very nice time thank you neela ji over to you you are muted neela ji you are muted so me ji i have a question that uh, you have talked about the potential of mind and all but uh, nowadays parents only are involved in that mobile and all they don't have the time to inculcate all these things how we will make them aware i know i will get their answers in the further three these thing sessions but i think that that's a very important thing you see mobile is times a reality of life in the same way as 20 years ago computers became a reality of life cars became a reality of life all these they are a new reality and yoga is balancing yoga is harmony yoga is creating a new normal in the previous session uh i think it was in yoga and women's health that i had discussed that you have the balance between the ida and the pingala and whenever this balance shifts there is some issue and we have to restore the balance does not mean that we have to go to what was there earlier the situation has changed if you are standing and you lean to your right to maintain the balance what do you have to do what does the body do why don't we all do make do this experiment i'll request all of you to stand up please stand up mm -hmm. raise your hands to the side uh, keep you know don't keep the feet uh, touching each other keep them about shoulder width apart hands to the side and now slowly and consciously start leaning to your right leaning to your right and just observe what is happening please don't fall and then come back to the center now lean to your left observe what is happening what prevents you from falling and come back to the center hands down sit down and please tell me somebody what is it that prevented you from falling 
we try to lean on the opposite side yes no no not we didn't lean on the opposite side but the opposite side leg starts coming up correct so the other side started pulling pulling yes. back yeah yeah so we have created a new normal where the balance is re established right. that is what we have to do mobiles and all these things are a new reality we can't run away from them but we have to find how we can these are tools but we don't know how to utilize them because we don't have a direction and yogic practices allow us to get that direction it allows us to stabilize the mind and utilize them as tools today we are utilizing technology we have some people from usa some people from london some people from australia some people from india different parts of the city do you think all of us could have gathered in same place and then gone back to our work immediately no technology made this possible and we can harness technology for a good purpose or we can be harnessed by technology and it takes us which wherever it goes so this is the principle allowing yoga to bring out the direction and once the direction is clear then the new normal is created thank you sami Okay. We will conclude the session now. Yes. So we will conclude with Shanti part, and the next session will be in the evening at seven uh, thirty p.m. India time. So uh, you know, depending on which time zones you are, you will just have to check uh, what is time in your areas. Please sit in a comfortable meditative posture, with your hands on your knees in Nyan or Chin Mudra. head neck shoulders back all in a straight line eyes and mouth gently closed become aware of the whole body from the top of your head to your toes awareness of your head neck shoulders arms chest upper back abdomen lower back hips legs the whole body bring your awareness to your eyebrow center and at the eyebrow center bhrumadhya visualize the form of either your guru or your ishta devata or the jyoti swarupa the jyoti the symbol of knowledge and allow the mind to gravitate towards this experience allow the mind to get connected to this experience maintaining your connection with this we shall chant the mantra om three times followed by the shanti part take a deep breath in असतो तमसो ज्योतिर्गमय मृत्योर्मात गमय सर्वस्ती 
पूर्ण मंगल लोका समस्ता सुखिनो भवन्तु ओम त्र्यंबक यजामहे सुगंधि पुष्टिवर्धनम पूर्वाकमिव बंधना मृत्योर्मुक्षीयृता ओं शांति 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 हैंडसिन प्रणाम मुद्रा माता च पिता बंधुश्च सखा विद्या मम देव 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 सर्व मम देव देव सर्व मम देव देव हरि ओ हरि ओम तत्सत जेंटली रब यो पाम्स अगेंस्ट ईच अदर प्लेस एम ऑन द क्लोज आईज एक्सपीरियंस द वॉम रेडिएटिंग फ्रॉम योर पाम्स टू योर आईज एनर्जाइजिंग द आईज एनर्जाइजिंग द ब्रेन एनर्जाइजिंग द होल बॉडी and gently move the palms away open eyes aryom satsat namo narayan namo narayan swami ji namo namo narayan swami ji thank you swami ji and thank you neela thank you swami ji namo narayan swami ji thank you so much thank you neela ji thank you all for participating Thank you. We'll all meet again in in evening India time. Namo Narayan. Namo.